Good morning, everyone. Uh, good to have you back this morning with us as we <clears throat> dive into the scripture. And uh, hopefully you guys had a great weekend. Hopefully you're not on, on a Super Bowl hangover and uh, stayed up too late watching the game. Uh, if you're anything like me, I stayed up watching the game. We had a great time here at church. Uh, and then I went home and uh, ended up turning on the Olympics and staying up later than I need to stay up. Um, but yeah, it was a good game yesterday. Uh, either way, I mean, if you're a football fan, it was fun to watch because it was, it was good. Anyway, I don't want to start talking about football because then, <clears throat> then I'll start talking about all kind of stuff. Um, it is kind of discouraging, kind of depressing that football season is over. No more college football, no pro football. Uh, now we got to wait for six months or so before we get some more football. Anyway, uh, I digress. We're going to talk from the scripture today. We are in the book of Numbers. Um, we've been walking with the <clears throat> nation of Israel all through the Old Testament, uh, the books of Exodus and Leviticus, and now we're into Numbers. <coughs> Excuse me, as we watch them travel from Egypt, where they were in slavery uh, for 400 years. Now they are traveling toward the promised land that the Lord has uh, graciously um, predicted that they would have. He gives them this land that they're going to take and acquire, a beautiful land. The Bible describes it as a, a land flowing with milk and honey, meaning it's completely fertile, uh, perfect for livestock, perfect for uh, crops and uh, agriculture, and uh, God's going to just protect them in all these different ways and he promises all these great things and so they're on this journey but on this journey we see that they encounter all kind of hardships and we've kind of mirrored that in our own life we've looked at how that parallels our life in Christ that we are waiting for our home and glory our promised land that it is uh, a for sure thing that's going to take place uh, but we're waiting in the in and during the waiting we struggle we fight temptation, we struggle with discouragement, we wrestle with certain things in life. And so we're talking about that kind of stuff as we walk through this, and we've been walking through this for several weeks now. Uh, if you have your Bible, we're going to be over in the book of Numbers uh, chapter 13 is where we're going to be at. And uh, I just want to just want to share a couple things here about this. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you, uh, man, you, you did something, you made a decision, Maybe it was a work decision or a family decision. You made the decision, and immediately after you made the decision to do that, you regretted it. You thought to yourself, oh my goodness, I can't believe I just did that. I can't believe I said that. I can't believe I bought that. I can't believe we did that. And you kind of regret it, right? I mean, immediately. A lot of people call that stuff, like especially from a uh, if you're buying something, they call it buyer's remorse, right? You think, oh, I need this, i got to have it, and then you buy it, and you think, oh, why did I spend the money on that kind of stuff? Well, we're going to see one of those situations here today with the nation of Israel. Did they made a decision to do something, and I know immediately, or at least pretty quickly afterward, they were, afterward, they were probably thinking, man, we should have really thought through that a little bit better. Um, and so I want to talk about that here today. We're getting into a, uh, an interesting part in the story here uh, of the nation of Israel as <clears throat> they travel to the, to the promised land. Now, what we do know is that as they travel to the promised land, <clears throat> they left Egypt, crossed the Red Sea, went to Mount Sinai, got the Ten Commandments, got the rest of the law, <clears throat> built this tabernacle that was a portable church, and they're kind of making their way incrementally over toward uh, the promised land and toward what we now know as the nation of Israel, the land of Israel. They're making their way over to this slice of land. If you don't know what we're talking about, is if you look on a map in the Middle East, <clears throat> you've got to uh, look for the Mediterranean Sea. Just to the east of the Mediterranean Sea, there is a strip of land that is between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River. Uh, you've got the Sea of Galilee and then the Jordan River that flows out of that, and that goes into the Dead Sea. <clears throat> in between those two bodies of water, Mediterranean Sea and Israel, or in uh, the Jordan River, you have Israel. This is that strip of land that they were going to acquire. It was a great land, a beautiful land. And so they're traveling there. What we're going to find out today is they had traveled for about two years, um, taking, and remember, this is not just like taking a couple of people on a, on a hike. We're talking about a million some odd people that they're traveling with. So it's 
a little bit bigger undertaking than what we're accustomed to thinking about, maybe. So in chapter 13 of the book of Numbers, we, we see where God is going to lead um, Moses to send some people into the promised land. They're, they're getting close, but they need to kind of know what they're up against, and so they need to spy out the land. Uh, and so God asks Moses to take some guys, so they pick 12 men that are going to go and spy out the land. Um, this is what he says in chapter 13, verse 17. He says, when Moses uh, sent them to explore Canaan, he said, go up to the, through the Negev and into the hill country, see what the land is like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak. Are they few or many? What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they walled or fortified? How is the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees in it or not? Do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land because it was a season for ripe grapes. So it says they went in and they surveyed the land and they toured the land. They spent 40 days there touring the land. It says in verse 23, when they reached the valley of Eshkol, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them carried on a pole between them along with the pomegranates and figs. That place was called the valley of Eshkol because of the cluster of grapes the Israelites cut off there. At the end of the 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. So they came back and they gave a report of what they found. 40 days, they investigated the land from the north to the south. They checked it all out, making sure that it was what the Lord had promised them. It tells us in verse 27 of Numbers 13, it says, They gave Moses an account. We went into the land which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. And here is its fruit. And they showed him this cluster of grapes and the pomegranates and all the other things they brought back. They're like, this land is incredible. I mean, every one of the, every one of the spies, all 12 of them, all said the same thing. This is a beautiful land. It is valuable. It's fertile. It's worth attaining. We should, we, we love this land. But then it says this, verse 28. They said, but the people who live there are powerful. And the cities are fortified and large. We even saw descendants of descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in Nega in the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and all along the Jordan. They go in verse thirty one. But the men who came back with them said, "We can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are." And they spread about the people of Israel a bad report about the land they explored. Uh, it says, The land that we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. Um, so here are these spies that come back. And initially, they're all on board, right? All the spies are saying, um, this, is, this is where we need to be. This is a beautiful land. But then 10 of those spies begin to kind of backpedal a little, little bit. Ten of them said, yeah, it's beautiful land, but they've got some fortified cities there. They've got some armies there. They've got some people there. They've got some men there, excuse me, that are giant men, powerful men, men that we could not fight against. Caleb, one of the 12 spies that went, he spoke up, verse 24, verse 30, I'm sorry, says, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But nobody believed. Nobody believed that they could do that. Joshua spoke up in chapter 14, verse 6. As Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of uh, Jephthah, uh, who were among those who had explored our land, tore their clothes because the assembly was so divided, and said to the entire Israelite assembly, The land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. Yet the Israelites did not listen. We know if you read the story, and, and you know the story, they decided to believe the ten spies who were negative, who were fearful, instead of believing Joshua and Caleb. In verse 2 of that same chapter, chapter 14, the Israelites all said to Moses, If only we had died in Egypt or uh, in this wilderness, 
Why is the Lord bringing us into a land uh, only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and travel back to Egypt. They were so angry, so pessimistic, so um, negative in what they were seeing. But Joshua and Caleb both said, yes, the land is beautiful. And yes, there's fortified cities. Yes, there's giants. Yes, there's powerful armies there. But we have the Lord. The Lord will see us through. The Lord will provide. The Lord will protect. The Lord will give us strength. The Lord will win the victory for us. Their eyes were on the uh, blessing of God rather than on uh, the enemy in front of them. Reminds me of David, King David, when David was just a young boy and he went down to the uh, to see the military army guys and there this giant out in front of the Philistine army and the giant Goliath and he said, I'll go fight Goliath. And so he goes out there and Goliath makes fun of him and he taunts him and says, who are you that you come at me? And David says, you come at me with, uh, with weapons and, and sword and your own strength. And David says, but I come against you in the name of the Lord. It is the Lord who's going to fight this battle. And Joshua and Caleb got that. They were like, listen, the Lord has not brought us here to lose. The Lord has brought us here promises to us. He will deliver. But the people saw the problems more than they saw the Lord. They reacted in fear rather than in trust. They allowed the physical world uh, and the enemy to dominate their thoughts and dominate their decisions to the degree that they gave up what was rightfully theirs in the promised land. And so this angered God that this was like, it wasn't just like for God, he wasn't just angry because it was one act of defiance, but over and over again, right? We've read these words of the Israelites all along where they said, man, we should go back and die in Egypt. We had it better in Egypt. We want to go back to Egypt. We, we, we don't like it in the wilderness, right? If I were God, I'd be like, well, fine, go on back to Egypt. You guys complain about it for 400 years. I took you out of it. Now you want to go back. That, that's, that's who I would be. But the Lord was patient with them. But finally, this moment of disobedience and mistrust finally was enough. The Lord said, listen, we're going to have to deal with this harshly. So the Bible says that God is going to cause them to wander in the wilderness. Let me just read a couple of these verses. This is verse 27 uh, of chapter 14. The Lord told Moses, how long will this wicked community grumble against me? I have heard the complaints of these grumbling Israelites, so tell them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very thing uh, you heard that I heard you say. In this wilderness, your bodies will fall. Every one of you, 20 years old or more, who has counted in the census and who has grumbled against me, not one of you will enter the land I swore with an uplifted hand to make you your home, except for Caleb and Joshua. As for you, as for your children, that you said would be taken as plunder, I will bring them in to enjoy this land that, I've, that, that you have rejected. But as for you, your bodies will fall in this wilderness. Your children will be shepherds here for 40 years, suffering for your unfaithfulness until the last of your bodies lies in the wilderness. For 40 years, one year for each of the 40 days you explore the land, you will suffer for your sins and know what it is like to have me against you. That is devastating words. You would not want to hear that. A um, couple things I just want to say about this. One, he makes a statement here and he says, um, <clears throat> he says, your children will be shepherds here for 40 years, suffering for your unfaithfulness. He says, your children are going to suffer for your unfaithfulness. Um, I think sometimes we miss that point that that our sins and our disobedience to the Lord causes others to suffer as well. There's collateral damage. It's not just about you. It's about those family members around you as well. The other thing I think is important that we recognize is um, that God is not holding his, their kids responsible for their bad decisions. Yes, they're going to have some collateral damage. And yes, they get caught up in the consequences of their parents. But they're not guilty of those sins. So it's not like the Lord is saying, hey, because you rejected me uh, as a nation, I'm not going to let your kids enter the promised land, right? It wasn't their fault. They, they didn't make that decision. They didn't have mistrust in the Lord and disobedience. So God is not going to hold that against them. I think that's important that we recognize sin doesn't get passed down to generations like that. 
Um, the other thing I think that God is, is doing here is teaching us about the severity of sin. He, he, he is letting us know um, that there are consequences to our decisions and our bad behavior. We live in a world today where everybody gets a participation trophy. And I hate to say it, we have, uh, I'm trying to see how I can say this politely, we have softened, we have softened the idea of reality in our world today, where you can be the worst ball player in the whole league and you still get a trophy because you participated. Um, we no longer have uh, people who win and lose. We no longer have people who realize that, that there are consequences. And what I'm saying here is I think it's important we recognize that uh, the reality of sin means that there are consequences to sin. And we see it, a, a stark reminder here with the Israelite nation. That as they chose to disobey God and not trust God, they suffered the consequences for that. God was going to give them this promised land. Yet because they would not trust in him, right, he is no longer going to allow them to rejoice in that. So I think that's important for us to recognize. I think sometimes we think, well, I'm, I'm kind of an average person. I'm, I'm not too bad or whatever. We're, we're going to get in. We're going to be okay. Um, man, I just wonder, do we really, do we really love the Lord? Um, and are, are we maybe setting ourselves up for disappointment by not really pursuing him the way we should. So just consider those things and uh, and the way we live our lives. Let's pray about that. God, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for the the words that we find in the scripture that instruct us on how to live. Lord, it's easy for us to point the finger at the, at the Israelites as they worried or stressed and didn't obey you and didn't trust you. Um, but we are prone to do the same thing, God, in our own life. When things come up against us, when we have battles we face in life and when we have uh, adversaries come against us, sometimes we think <clears throat> that, that there's no way we can battle through this. There's no way that we can win. But God, we re realize that with you, all things are possible. So help us put our complete trust in you and uh, that you would see us through all things, uh, especially those temptations we face. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, have a good afternoon today. Thanks for joining us. We'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. All right, God bless.